Since its founding in 1995, Bioware grew in popularity among the gaming sphere with their role-playing games that featured rich stories and deep characters. After cutting their teeth by creating games based on the Dungeons & Dragons universe, Bioware switched over to another well-known license with Star Wars Knights of the Old Republic in 2003. Knights of the Old Republic broke ground for Bioware in more ways than one. It was a huge critical success, and more importantly, it was the first RPG from the studio to hit home consoles in the form of the original Xbox. Bioware's ambitions only grew, and in the decade following the release of Knights of the Old Republic, Bioware would only rise and cement itself as one of the most talented developers in the world, before that prestige came crashing down following a less than stellar showing in recent years. The story of Bioware, however, is not what we're looking at today. Instead, we'll be taking a look at arguably Bioware's biggest and most successful series of games, Mass Effect. This is the story behind one of gaming's most fascinating universes and the people who brought it to life. This is the story of Mass Effect. Mass Effect's origins date back to the founding of Bioware itself. In 1995, Bioware was founded by Ray Mizuka and Greg Zeshuk in the city of Edmonton in Alberta, Canada. Bioware's early titles included mech simulators and third-person shooters, but their best-known work was their trio of PC RPGs released between 1998 and 2002, based on the Dungeon and Dragons brand. Baldur's Gate 1 and 2 and Neverwinter Nights made Bioware one of the many well-known RPG developers of the era. Bioware's best-known work came from already established IPs, and this would continue with their next release, but the company had bigger plans. Frustrated with the licensing process and wanting to create their own world, the developers at Bioware began work on various new projects in the early 2000s. Jade Empire began development in 2001, and Dragon Age followed in 2002. Jade Empire was revealed in 2003 as an Xbox exclusive. Dragon Age was first shown off a year later at E3 2004 as a fantasy RPG for PCs. Both titles showed Bioware's ambitious plans to craft their own lineup of original RPGs, but there was still one more project to come. In September 2004, Bioware announced that they were working on yet another title, but this time the game would be running in Unreal Engine 3, a departure for the company, as they typically utilize their own in-house engines, notably the Infinity, Aurora, and Odyssey engines. This new title was still early in development, so details weren't being given away just yet. Many speculated that the new game would be a first-person shooter, given the popularity of the Unreal Engine with shooting titles. Others wondered what exactly Bioware was cooking up, and if the massive slate of original games they had in development would ever see the light of day. Bioware's unnamed Unreal project remained unnamed for over a year. It wasn't until X05, an Xbox press event held in Amsterdam that year, that Mass Effect was revealed to the world as an exclusive for Microsoft's upcoming Xbox 360. In a minute-long teaser, Bioware prepped the world for their first original IP set in the far future of the 23rd century. Early versions of alien creatures and Commander Shepard, the protagonist, were shown, but no gameplay or story details were revealed. No release date was given during the trailer, but it was clear that Bioware's future as a developer was promising. So promising that by the end of 2005, they partnered with Pandemic Studios, creating VG Holding Corp. Elevation Partners, a private equity fund, invested $300 million into the partnership, helping establish Bioware as one of the biggest independent developers in the games industry. Mass Effect began development in early 2004 after Star Wars Knights of the Old Republic development team completed a port of the title to PCs. Casey Hudson, the director of Knights of the Old Republic, once again led his team with KOTOR scriptwriter Drew Karpishan coming onto Mass Effect as lead writer. Preston Watamak served as lead designer and is also credited in creating the Mass Effect series. Mass Effect itself was meant as an evolution to Knights of the Old Republic notably in the area of combat, moving away from turn-based traditional RPG mechanics to a faster-paced tactical third-person shooter. Bioware created the game as a first title in a trilogy of games, giving developers a chance to tell stories that their previous works were unable to do. Each of Mass Effect's various planets were headed by a single writer, with other writers on the team reviewing the work and making suggestions for changes. 
games like Starflight and Star Control were huge inspiration for the game's sense of discovery through space exploration. Films like Star Wars, Alien, and Final Fantasy The Spirits Within inspired the game's many artistic qualities. Going into 2006, not much was known about Mass Effect. In 2005, Jade Empire was released for the original Xbox to less than stellar sales, and many began to fear for Mass Effect's future. Mass Effect was shown off in greater detail than ever before during Microsoft's press conference at E3 2006. The trailer was primarily story focused and took its time introducing new characters to many eager fans. No real gameplay was shown during the nearly five minute long trailer, but a rough idea was shown off featuring third person shooting combat. Mass Effect showing at E3 helped it earn the best role playing game award at the show from the Game Critic Awards. The road show didn't stop there. In September 2006, Mass Effect was given a release window before the X06 event in Barcelona. Mass Effect was coming to the Xbox 360 sometime in 2007 alongside several other heavy hitting games. Mass Effect wasn't shown to the public at X06, but a private demo was shown at the event. Gameplay features were detailed for the first time, including exploration and combat. Later that year in December, the Mass Effect demo was uploaded online for all to see. This demo, however, would pale in comparison to Mass Effect's next showing. At the Game Developers Conference in March of 2007, the first 60 minutes of gameplay for Mass Effect were shown off at the event. The demo wasn't a one-to-one -one experience that players would see with the final release, as certain sections from the first hour were cut due to time constraints. Still. Players finally got a look at Commander Shepard in their first in-game mission, as well as the character creation tools used to personalize Commander Shepard to the player's liking. The demo received critical praise and only helped increase the hype surrounding Bioware's sci-fi epic. Mass Effect once again made an appearance at E3 in 2007, and it served as one of the final major showcases for the game. During Microsoft's press conference, Mass Effect largely took a backseat to Microsoft's biggest game of the year, Halo 3. However, new details about the game still emerged. Most notably, Mass Effect's release window was made even smaller with the announcement that the title would be coming out in November 2007. Just like at E3 2006, Mass Effect walked away from E3 winning the Game Critics Award for Best Role Playing Game for the second year in a row. Mass Effect also won Best Console Game, but failed to win the overall Best in Show Award, losing to Rock Band. Mass Effect continued to be shown off in the final months before its release with the team at Bioware working around the clock to get the game ready for launch. Everything was going great for Bioware's new RPG, but one month before release, VG Holding Corp was purchased by Electronic Arts. While the deal didn't affect Mass Effect's release or Bioware's upcoming Sonic the Hedgehog RPG for Nintendo DS, it did put more pressure than ever for Bioware to knock it out of the park. If Bioware wanted to be known for more than Star Wars or Dungeons and Dragons RPGs, this could be their last shot at doing so. After nearly four years of development, Mass Effect launched exclusively for the Xbox 360 on November 20th, 2007. A standard edition was made available, as well as a collector's edition that included an exclusive bonus disc, a 36 page art book, and a steel book. Within three weeks of the game's launch, more than 1 million copies of Mass Effect were sold. Critically, the game was received with near universal acclaim. Game Informer awarded the title a 9.75 out of 10, IGN gave it a 9.4, and G4TV's X-Play awarded it a perfect 5 out of 5. Mass Effect's popularity gave it a leg up when it came to the end of the year awards, but the title was largely overshadowed by other critically acclaimed releases like Bioshock and Super Mario Galaxy. Mass Effect did win Best RPG Award at the 2008 Interactive Awards, and it won Game of the Year from the New York Times. Sadly for Mass Effect and Bioware, the title would soon gain more notoriety than ever before, thanks in part to conservative media circles. In early 2008, conservative bloggers and TV personalities brought attention to the game's optional side quest to become romantically involved with one of the game's NPCs. Articles and opinion pieces claimed that players were able to sodomize and rape their partner during in-game romantic scenes, with some going so far as describing the entire game as pornography. Claims were so ridiculous that even disbarred attorney Jack Thompson, a lawyer with a vendetta against violent and obscene video games, defended the game on Fox News, a conservative American news channel. The controversy quickly died down around the game, but left a lasting impact on the team at Bioware and how they would handle romantic relationships in future titles. Bioware's work wasn't done after release. On March 10, 2008, 
Bring Down the Sky, the first of two DLC expansions to Mass Effect, was released on the Xbox Live Marketplace. The DLC offered players a new mission to help save a planet and a chance to once again fill the shoes of Commander Shepard. Mass Effect's exclusivity to the Xbox 360 was short-lived. In early 2008, a PC port of Mass Effect was announced, following Bioware's line of previous Xbox exclusives to personal computers. The PC version released on May 28, 2008 to critical acclaim, much like the original Xbox 360 release. In addition to all of the original content, the PC version boasted better visuals, faster load times, and the Bring Down the Sky DLC as a free add-on. The PC version hit PAL regions a month later. The PC port of Mass Effect also marked the first release under Bioware's name to be published by EA. The PC port was handled primarily by Demiurge Studios, with the main teams at Bioware working on other projects. Demiurge continued their work on the original Mass Effect and released Pinnacle Station, the second and final piece of DLC for the game, on August 25, 2009, for both Xbox 360 and PC. The DLC came as a surprise to many, as Mass Effect 2 had already been revealed to the public with an anticipated release of Quarter 1 2010. Pinnacle Station focused primarily on the game's combat, with a series of challenges ranging from time attack to survival. Pinnacle Station was met with harsh reviews, with IGN giving the DLC a 5 out of 10. The headline for the review summed it up nicely. Was this really necessary? By early 2010, Mass Effect 2 hit store shelves, and with it, the story of the original Mass Effect largely comes to an end. The beginning of Bioware's sci-fi trilogy managed to do everything it set out to accomplish, but there was one final frontier for the game. In 2012, after the release of Mass Effect 3, a re-release of the entire trilogy came out by the end of the year for PC, Xbox 360, and PlayStation 3. The trilogy included the first Mass Effect and marked the first time the original release was available on PlayStation 3. The PS3 port was handled by Edge of Reality, the same studio that ported Dragon Age Origins to the PS3 and Xbox 360. Mass Effect was also released on PlayStation Network as a downloadable title, but a physical standalone release of the first game never made it to Sony's 7th generation home console. My own experience with Mass Effect is surprisingly short-lived. I never had an Xbox 360 while it was Microsoft's primary console, and I didn't get a computer capable of running modern games until 2012. When Mass Effect hit the PlayStation Network, I immediately bought it with plans to play through the entire trilogy after I had already finished Mass Effect 2. Sadly, I never actually played this port until years later, in an attempt to cheer up my wife, who was recovering from a broken ankle. My time with the PS3 port didn't last more than a few hours. I was put off by the now outdated design, and my wife just wasn't into the game like she was others. That's mostly why I'm so excited for Mass Effect Legendary Edition. Not only is it an update to some of my favorite games of all time, but it's giving us a more modern version of the original Mass Effect for the first time. I plan on sinking my teeth back into the Mass Effect universe as soon as my copy of the game arrives. And you better believe, I'm starting with the original game. Development of Mass Effect 2 began in earnest after the release of Mass Effect in 2007. Casey Hudson continued his role as director of the game, and Drew Carpetian returned as lead writer. Much of the groundwork for Mass Effect 2 was already implemented with the release of the original. For much of the team at Bioware, the goals for Mass Effect 2 revolved around refining the gameplay while further fleshing out the Mass Effect universe. Bioware focused on improving the game's shooting combat before adding in RPG elements to give Mass Effect 2 a more modern feel. Gone was the need to constantly pause the combat to give orders to squad mates. Instead, menu options would appear in real time to help keep the focus on combat. Regenerating health was added to the game, alongside the use of ammo for weapons to add more tension to the game's combat. Exploration, however, was significantly toned down, as the team at Bioware axed the planetary vehicle excursions, opting for more streamlined level design. Mass Effect 2 was officially revealed at the Game Developers Conference in 2009 to mostly positive reception. Unlike the original Mass Effect, Mass Effect 2 was scheduled to release on both the Xbox 360 and PC on the same day with EA publishing the title. During the reveal, Bioware showcased two different scenes, one focusing on the new title's improvement to combat, while the other focused on conversations. A minute-long teaser trailer for the game was also shown off. The trailer didn't feature any noticeable improvements to the gameplay, but left players with a single message regarding the game's protagonist. Commander Shepard was killed in action. 
Mass Effect 2 was showcased at E3 2009 with a new teaser trailer and a playable demo at the show. Like Mass Effect 1, Mass Effect 2 won the Best Role Playing Game Award from the Game Critics Awards and was nominated for Best Console Game and Best of Show, losing both awards to Naughty Dog's Uncharted 2. Mass Effect 2's shorter development time wasn't without struggles. The Great Recession caused the game's original budget to be cut, and the 2009 flu pandemic caused many developers to be unable to work in the final few months of the game's development. Over 150 people worked on Mass Effect 2, including some staff members of EA Montreal. As development came closer to its end in October of 2009, Mass Effect 2 was given its final release window of January 2010. On January 26, 2010, Mass Effect 2 released in North America for both the PC and Xbox 360. PAL Territories received the game a few days later. The sequel was immediately hit with rave reviews, including a 9.6 from IGN and a perfect score from Eurogamer. During the week of Mass Effect 2's release, over 2 million copies of the game were shipped. A standard edition and collector's edition were made available from retailers, while a digital deluxe version of the game was sold through digital storefronts. During its first few days on the market, Mass Effect 2 sold more than half a million units, making the title an immediate commercial success. Mass Effect 2 was sold with an online pass, like many of EA's games during the early 2010s. This online pass, which was available in all new copies of the game, gave players access to the Cerberus Network, an in-game hub for news on Mass Effect. More importantly, Cerberus Network unlocked key pieces of downloadable content for Mass Effect 2. Five pieces of downloadable content were made available for the Cerberus Network within the first two months after launch. Most of these pieces of DLC simply gave the player new weapons and cosmetic upgrades to armor, but two of these downloadable expansions offered new story missions that were inaccessible to those who received the game as a second-hand copy. The worst of these was Zaid, The Price of Revenge. Released only two days after Mass Effect 2 came out, Zaid came with a new squad mate, the titular character himself, and two new in-game missions. Like many of EA's online passes, Mass Effect 2's was met with criticism from both the gaming industry and gamers themselves. Even bonus items that came with physical copies of Mass Effect 2 at various retailers required the player to use the Cerberus network to activate these products. Thankfully, EA ended their practice of online passes around the start of the 8th generation of gaming. In May 2013, the Cerberus network was officially shut down and all the DLC available on it was made free on their respective digital storefronts. In the months following Mass Effect 2's release, multiple DLC packs were released on the Xbox Live Marketplace and through EA's Origin service or through Bioware's website for the PC version. In April of 2010, Kasami, Stolen Memory, was released for $6.99. The DLC pack included a new squad member, Kasami, as well as two additional missions revolving around her character. The next major DLC released, Overlord, hit digital marketplaces in June of 2010. Like the Kasami DLC pack, Overlord retailed for $6.99 and included four new missions set on the planet Ait. The final piece of major DLC in 2010 came in September with the release of Lair of the Shadow Broker for $9.99. This DLC pack followed Mass Effect 1 character Liara Sony and her dealings with the underworld of the Mass Effect universe with the Shadow Broker. All three pieces of DLC were met with a positive reception, with Lair of the Shadow Broker receiving notable attention for its expansion of the overarching story of the Mass Effect trilogy. At the end of 2010, Mass Effect 2 was a tour de force for various video game award programs. The title was nominated for several awards, including Best RPG, Best Story, and the overall Best Game of 2010. The most notable award Mass Effect 2 won was Game of the Year from the Interactive Achievement Awards the first of two that BioWare would claim. When EA purchased BioWare in 2007, many games journalists were quick to ask about the possibility of Mass Effect releasing on Sony's PlayStation 3. BioWare denied the existence of a PlayStation 3 version of Mass Effect 2 in the run-up to its release, saying that the game would remain an Xbox 360 console exclusive for the time being. Luckily for PlayStation fans, the window of exclusivity wouldn't last too long. At Gamescom 2010, a port of Mass Effect 2 was announced for the PlayStation 3 with a release window of January 2011. This port was officially released on January 18, 2011, almost one year after the release of Mass Effect 2 on other consoles. The PS3 version was notable for a handful of reasons. This version of the game came with all previously downloadable content for free and included the then PlayStation exclusive Mass Effect Genesis. 
One concern many gamers had upon learning of a PlayStation 3 version of Mass Effect 2 was over the save data transfer used in the Xbox 360 and PC versions. In these versions, players could import the Commander Shepard they played the first game with. In doing so, actions taken in the previous title would affect Shepard's relationships with the world around them. There were also key decisions made during Mass Effect, such as having to save one of two crewmates and leaving the other to die. In the sequels, the abandoned character would not appear if the player imported their save data, adding a layer of personalization and ownership players experienced with Shepard. Mass Effect Genesis attempted to fix this problem. Produced by Dark Horse Comics, Genesis gave players an interactive comic that covered six major decisions the players would normally have made in Mass Effect 1. Mass Effect Genesis was included as a free download with the PlayStation 3 version and occurred after the opening mission of Mass Effect 2 and before the player customized Shepard to start their adventure. Genesis only remained a PlayStation exclusive for a few months. In March of 2011, Mass Effect Genesis was released on both PC and Xbox 360 for $3.99. One final piece of DLC was released for Mass Effect 2 in March of 2011. Arrival followed Shepard and their crew to the edge of the galaxy to investigate reports of an incoming invasion of the Reapers, the primary antagonist of Mass Effect 3. Arrival was available on all platforms at the same time for $6.99 and brought an end to Bioware's work on the second Mass Effect game. My own journey with the Mass Effect series began with the second entry. At the time, I didn't have an Xbox 360 or a PC, so my only option to play the sequel came from the PS3 version. I waited over a year before picking up Mass Effect 2, using some money from a senior trip to purchase both it and the Metal Gear Solid HD collection. I spent most of my summer playing through the Metal Gear Solid games, and that unfortunately left Mass Effect 2 on the back burner. It wasn't until later that fall, after I moved into a dorm at my college, that I finally dived in. I was immediately hooked by the game. Every night I set aside time between classes, a floundering social life, and my early attempts at YouTube to check in with Commander Shepard and the rest of the crew on the Normandy. It was the first game I actually beat after moving away from home, and in many ways represents the first game I played as an adult. My love for the series spread. My roommate at the time grew so fond of watching me play in our tiny room that he ended up buying the Mass Effect games for PC. It quickly became known around the dorm that I was playing the game. My RA asked me several times to turn down the volume, often to my own dismay. My sweet mate casually dropped Godspeed Commander at the end of a conversation, something that immediately brightened my day. Mass Effect 2 was my comfort game during an incredibly stressful time in my life. No matter what was happening, be it my horrible grades or loneliness from a lack of friends, Mass Effect 2 was always there for me. I'll never forget piloting the Normandy into the final mission, losing three squad mates along the way because I didn't upgrade my ship. It was heart-wrenching. I'd spent so many hours with all these characters, and watching them die on screen tore a hole through my heart. Mass Effect 2 is one of my favorite games of all time, and my personal favorite of the Mass Effect trilogy. I know I'll never be able to experience this masterpiece for the first time again, but I can't wait to jump back in with the Legendary Edition. After all, it's up to me to save the galaxy from the Collectors. The 2010 Spike Video Game Awards saw Bioware at the top of their game. Mass Effect 2 was nominated for nine different awards at the show, including Game of the Year. Bioware walked away with three awards that evening, including the coveted Studio of the Year award. The biggest news of the show, however, came from the announcement of Mass Effect 3 with its release date of Holiday 2011. The minute-long teaser followed the reveals of previous titles and didn't show any gameplay. Instead, a CGI trailer showed the Reapers, the overarching antagonistic threat of the trilogy, coming to Earth to wreak havoc. Mass Effect 3's announcement didn't come as a surprise given Bioware's intentions to make a trilogy of games. What did surprise some was the list of launch platforms. For the first time ever, a Mass Effect game would launch on Xbox 360, PC, and PlayStation 3 all on the same day. The announcement came only a month before the release of Mass Effect 2 on PlayStation 3, showing Bioware's and EA's hopes of expanding the franchise beyond its core base of PC and Xbox users. For the production of Mass Effect 3, the team at Bioware began working on the third title before Mass Effect 2 was finished. Casey Hudson once again returned to direct and focused on once again improving the core gameplay of Mass Effect to appeal to a wider audience. Mac Walters, co-writer for Mass Effect 2, joined the Mass Effect 3 team as head writer for the third entry, as Drew Karpishan left to work on Bioware's new Star Wars MMO, Star Wars The Old Republic. 
On the narrative side, Bioware wanted to make Mass Effect 3 more accessible to newcomers, something that Mass Effect 2 struggled to pull off properly without previous knowledge of the series. Mass Effect 3 was a technically challenging game to make. The script required 40,000 lines of dialogue to be recorded in order to properly take advantage of the game's many unique scenarios and the choices the players made over the previous two entries. For comparison, Mass Effect 1 had roughly half that many lines of dialogue, and Mass Effect 2 clocked in at about 25,000. A two-year timetable was given for Mass Effect 3, but it quickly became clear that the game would need more time to achieve the same level of polish as BioWare's other games. In May of 2011, Mass Effect 3 was delayed from its original Quarter 4 2011 release to Quarter 1 2012. Mass Effect 3's first major showcase came in May of 2011 at E3. During Microsoft's press conference, BioWare co-founder Ray Muzaka came on stage. Connect support for Mass Effect 3 was announced and showcased during a live demo. Connect support for Mass Effect 3 was limited compared to what many of the other Connect games showed. With the Connect, commands to squadmates could now be performed with your voice as opposed to button presses. During conversations, the player could choose dialogue options by saying them out loud, again removing the need to press a button. The demo ended with Musica stating that Mass Effect 3 would be the best Mass Effect yet, and the premiere version of the game would be the Xbox 360 version, as its included voice commands through Kinect put it above the other versions. More importantly, he asked Mass Effect fans to check out EA's upcoming press conference, which started only 90 minutes after Microsoft's event. EA's press conference started off with another look at Mass Effect 3. For this press event, Mass Effect 3 director Casey Hudson took the stage. The primary focus at EA's event was put on Mass Effect 3's story and trying to pull new players in by describing it as an action-packed, climactic ending to one of the generation's best stories. An on-stage demo featured Commander Shepard and their crew going up against one of the hulking death machines known as the Reapers. Additionally, a new trailer titled The Fall of Earth was showcased. The trailer ended with a release date. The Mass Effect trilogy would come to a close on March 6, 2012. Like past entries, Mass Effect 3 was nominated for Best Role-Playing Game and Best Console Game at the show by the Game Critics Awards. Unfortunately for the third entry in the series, it lost both of these awards to Bethesda's Elder Scrolls V Skyrim. Following E3, Mass Effect 3 was showcased at various other events, including the San Diego Comic-Con and PAX Prime in Seattle. In October, the last piece of major announcements for the game came. First revealed in copies of PC Power Play, Mass Effect 3 added a new multiplayer mode, a first for the series. Details on the online co-op mode were given later that day in a forum post on BioWare's website. The following month, however, a beta for Mass Effect 3 was leaked on Xbox Live, giving many people a chance to dig into many of the game's spoiler-filled plot points. BioWare acknowledged the leak in the following days, but stated that the final storyline of Mass Effect 3 would be different from the early leaked version. They also encouraged players to avoid reading the plot leaks and instead experience the story for themselves in full when Mass Effect 3 releases. In the lead up to release in 2012, marketing for Mass Effect 3 went into full blitz. Previous entries in the series had primarily focused on the male version of Commander Shepard. Even during Mass Effect 3's demos, male Shepard was the primary focal point as opposed to the female version of the character that was available since the first entry. Mass Effect 3's marketing tried to change this by showcasing both female and male versions of the character. Female Shepard, or Fem Shep as she is referred to within the fan community, received her own version of Mass Effect 3 trailers and even managed to make her way onto Mass Effect 3's box art, albeit on the reverse side of the cover art. Mass Effect 3 was released on time following its delay on March 6, 2012 for the Xbox 360, PlayStation 3, and PC. Like Mass Effect 2, three versions of the game were available for purchase the Standard Edition, a Digital Deluxe Edition, and a Collector's Edition that included a Steelbook, Artbook, and 7 Patch, a download code for the DLC From Ashes, and more. Europe and Australia received the game in the following days. Critical reception was strong right out of the gate. IGN gave Mass Effect 3 a 9.5 out of 10, with Eurogamer, Game Informer, and G4TV's X-Play all giving it a perfect score. These high scores quickly translated into strong sales. During its first month on the market, Mass Effect 3 sold 1.3 million copies according to the MPD group, with nearly 900,000 copies being sold within the first 24 hours of release. 
However, despite all the critical acclaim and strong sales, controversy followed the game following its releases. Like with Mass Effect 2, EA opted to include an online pass for Mass Effect 3 as well. Unlike last time, Mass Effect 3's online pass was used to unlock the game's multiplayer mode. Owners of used copy of the game that already had their online pass used were forced to pay an additional $20 in order to unlock the multiplayer mode, despite it being available on the game disc. Day 1 DLC was also present for Mass Effect 3. From Ashes detailed events regarding Cerberus' attempt to take over a human colony in Eden Prime. The DLC included an additional playable character, and was described by many as something that the original game should have included, collector's edition or not. The DLC retailed on online marketplaces for a total of $10. The biggest controversy came from the ending of Mass Effect 3. Upon the ending of the game, the player was given three choices, highlighted by the colors red, blue, and green. Each of these endings play out largely the same, and left many fans dissatisfied. The narrow focus of the ending left many feeling like they had unlocked any other ending in a video game, as opposed to a more personalized ending, given the many choices players could make on their journey through all three games. Some fans even went to extremes over the ending of the game, contacting the Federal Trade Commission and Better Business Bureau in an attempt to claim that Bioware had falsely advertised the title. Within a few weeks of Mass Effect 3's release, Rei Mizaka announced that Bioware would be addressing fan concerns and that an announcement regarding the game's ending would come sometime in April 2012. Bioware announced that a free, downloadable expansion, known as the Extended Cut, would address players' concerns and add more to the game's ending. Fleshing out the ending and adding more characterization were the primary target, as Bioware wished to keep the overall ending the same. On June 26, 2012, the Extended Cut was released on Xbox Live and PC. The PS3 version of the Extended Cut was released a week later on July 4th. Opinions were ultimately mixed on the Extended Cut's ending, with some praising the additions and others claiming that it didn't do enough. Regardless, it's important to note the additional time and effort Bioware put into expanding the ending while continuing to work on other projects within the company. Mass Effect 3 was shown off at E3 2012, but in a much smaller capacity compared to previous years. The only major piece of news for the game came during Nintendo's re-unveiling of the Nintendo Wii U. A port of Mass Effect 3, known as Mass Effect 3 Special Edition, was announced as a launch game for the Wii U and included some new gamepad-exclusive features. The biggest news of the summer, however, was the second major piece of DLC for Mass Effect 3. In August, Leviathan was announced and released across all platforms for $9.99. The new DLC included a whopping 10 additional missions, focusing on Shepard and their crew's attempts to find a mysterious being in the far reaches of space that could potentially defeat the Reapers. Reviews were generally positive, ranging from scores of 6 to 8 out of 10s. September was a major month of announcements for Bioware. On September 26, the Mass Effect trilogy was announced for PC, Xbox 360, and PlayStation 3. The trilogy included all three Mass Effect games, including a release of Mass Effect 1 for the PlayStation 3. The trilogy didn't come with all the DLC for the games, and the DLC varied between platforms. The Xbox 360 version received no additional DLC, with only the online passes for Mass Effect 2 and 3 included. The PC version included the same online passes and the DLC for Mass Effect 1, which was already available for free on the platform. The PS3 version received the most DLC, Bring Down the Sky, both battle passes, and the DLC released on disc for Mass Effect 2 were all included in the package. Pinnacle Station, the piece of Mass Effect 1 DLC created by Demiurge Studios, was not available for the PlayStation 3 version of the game and is the only piece of Mass Effect DLC that remains exclusive to the Xbox 360 and PC versions of the game. The other big announcement that month came from BioWare's co-founders, Rei Mizaka and Greg Zishek. After founding the development studio in 1995, both men announced their intentions to leave the developer for new challenges outside the world of game development. The duo had made their intentions known to EA back in April following the release of Mass Effect 3. The news came only one day after Bioware confirmed that a third title in their Dragon Age series was in development. This departure wouldn't have an immediate effect on Bioware or the Mass Effect series, but would come to haunt the studio in the latter half of the 2010s. November was another big month for Mass Effect 3. The Mass Effect trilogy released on Xbox 360 and PC on November 6 in North America, with power releases following in the days after. On November 18th, Mass Effect made its debut on a Nintendo console with Mass Effect 3 Special Edition. The Wii U version of the game came with some added bonuses like the aforementioned touch controls. 
Additionally, the From Ashes and Extended Cut DLC packs were included on the disc. Additional pieces of downloadable content were never made available for the Wii U version of the game. Like with the PlayStation 3 version before it, Mass Effect 3 on the Wii U ran into the immediate problem of not having access to past entries in the series. To remedy this, BioWare created Mass Effect Genesis 2 to cover the story beats of the first two games before players jumped into the third entry. Genesis 2 was made available on Xbox 360, PC, and PlayStation 3 in April of 2013 for the price of $3.99. Finally, at the end of the month, the third major piece of DLC, Omega, hit digital storefronts for $14.99. Developed outside of Bioware at EA Montreal, the DLC pack focused on the titular Omega Station featured in previous entries of the series as Cerberus attempts to seize control of it. The pack included five additional missions and received mixed reviews due to the lack of compelling story. December was significantly quieter for the Mass Effect series, as the Mass Effect trilogy made its way onto store shelves on December 6th for the PlayStation 3. The final big announcement for Mass Effect 3 came in February 2013 with the announcement of Citadel, the final DLC expansion for Mass Effect 3. Citadel, developed in-house by Bioware, was created as the ultimate send-off to the trilogy, with Bioware bringing multiple writers and voice actors in to reprise their roles in a fanservice heavy expansion. Citadel came out on March 5, 2013, almost one year after the release of Mass Effect 3 for $14.99. The release was met with strong reviews from critics and love from fans. An additional 15 missions were included in the final pack as Shepard and their crew uncover a mystery of a conspiracy targeted at Shepard themselves. In the years following Mass Effect 3's release, the Mass Effect series went dormant as Bioware focused their efforts on their first 8th generation release, Dragon Age Inquisition. At E3 2015, the first Mass Effect was announced as one of the first Xbox 360 games made backwards compatible with the Xbox One. Mass Effect 2 and 3 were made backwards compatible in November 2016. Like with Mass Effect 2, I was a little late to the party for Mass Effect 3. Having played the second game during my first semester of college, I asked for a copy of Mass Effect 3 for Christmas at the end of 2012. Being a college student meant I had roughly a budget of zero dollars for video games at the time, and the opportunity to get new games was few and far between. I was ecstatic to receive a copy that Christmas from my girlfriend and later spouse. Best of all, it was the collector's edition of the game, albeit a used one. Upon returning to college for my second semester, Mass Effect 3 filled largely the same role as Mass Effect 2 had during my first semester. I played the game at any chance I could get, sometimes to the detriment of my own sleep schedule. I ended up downloading some of the apps associated with the game on my phone to keep my adventure going while I walked to class or was eating lunch. I even purchased the game's online pass off of eBay and sunk quite a bit of time into Mass Effect 3's multiplayer, something I'll miss in the upcoming Legendary re-release. The most important thing, at least in the years since the trilogy came out, is how much more I've grown to appreciate Mass Effect as a whole. I haven't played too much of the series since college, but I've always had intentions of returning to the series. I've really grown to appreciate Bioware's knack for storytelling, their focus on making characters as fleshed out as possible, and their decision to include queer relationship options at a time when it was still somewhat taboo in the Western world. It's given me a chance to reflect on my own life and my own decisions. Whenever I played their Mass Effect, it never felt like a game to me. Yeah, I pressed buttons on a controller to shoot bad guys with a gun. That is very much part of the video game experience. But the parts I remember best and cherish most are the ones with Mass Effect's wide cast of characters. As I'm making these videos, I'm awaiting my own copy of Mass Effect Legendary Edition to arrive in the mail so I can fire up the engines of the Normandy once more and save the galaxy from the Reaper threat. To me, that's the real story of the Mass Effect series. It isn't about who made which game or which system they appeared on. It's about the unique and personalized experience of a galaxy that feels foreign and familiar at the same time. I think it goes without saying that I wholeheartedly recommend these fantastic games if you've never played them before. It's one of the best science fiction experiences in the medium of storytelling. Rumors regarding a fourth entry in the Mass Effect series began as early as 2012 before Mass Effect 3 was even released. In fact, several people had already started working on a new Mass Effect during this time, although Bioware was primarily focused on creating DLC for Mass Effect 3 and working on the upcoming installment in the Dragon Age series. This new installment wasn't being led by Bioware's team in Edmonton, however. A new team, composed of Mass Effect veterans and newcomers based out of Montreal, would take the lead. 
Bioware Montreal was founded in 2009 as part of EA and Bioware's expansion into the genre of RPGs and MMOs. It wasn't the first satellite studio for Bioware. In 2006, Bioware opened a new studio in Austin, Texas to develop Star Wars The Old Republic. In addition, EA-owned Mythic Entertainment was rebranded under the Bioware name as Bioware Mythic in 2009. Alongside the main studio in Edmonton, the Bioware group of studios showed a lot of promise to deliver big games and, more importantly, big profits. Bioware Montreal cut their teeth by assisting with the production of Mass Effect 2, crafting the game's uncharted world missions. The team worked their way up to Star Player with Mass Effect 3's Omega DLC. Going into 2013, Casey Hudson, director of the Mass Effect trilogy, came forward with news on Mass Effect 4 and Bioware as a whole. The main team that worked on Mass Effect was moving to a new IP, and Bioware Montreal was taking the lead on the new Mass Effect game. Hudson remained in the picture for the new Mass Effect as an executive producer, but Bioware Montreal was handling the core of the game's design, not Bioware Edmonton. From the beginning of development, the team came to some important decisions regarding the game's story. Commander Shepard and the Reapers, the protagonist and antagonist respectively of the Mass Effect trilogy, would not be the focus of the story. Early concepts for the story focused on the First Contact War, an intergalactic battle between humans and the alien race of Turians that took place in the years before the Mass Effect trilogy. Casey Hudson went on to Twitter to ask fans to see what they might want in a new Mass Effect game, offering players vague directions for the story. Players were in overwhelming agreement about one thing. They weren't interested in events taking place before the Mass Effect trilogy. They wanted a sequel, and the first Contact War plan was scrapped. The story took a different turn. Instead of having players explore the same galaxy as the Mass Effect trilogy, this new Mass Effect would take place in the Andromeda Galaxy, set centuries after the events of the trilogy. This new galactic setting offered up a ton of opportunities for the developers at Bioware, and became the folly of their ambitious goals. Bioware brought on Gerard Leoni, the former director of titles like Spider-Man Web of Shadows, to lead the new Mass Effect team. Leheny is credited with crafting the original idea for the game's story, where the player is sent to the Andromeda Galaxy as a contingency plan against the Reaper threat. At first, the Mass Effect development team wished for players to explore large, procedurally generated worlds that they could explore with their own ship. Concepts showed the player entering a planet's atmosphere, exploring the environment to their heart's content, before leaving for the next world. The idea, not unlike 2016's No Man's Sky, was meant to show the world that Bioware could do more than just craft compelling characters, interesting stories, and deep lore. Exploration would be a key focus for the next game, but players would need more ways of traversal than just a ship. Concepts for jetpacks and a new vehicle named the Nomad quickly came into place to help make this new Mass Effect feel like a wholly unique experience when compared to past games. While it was still early in development, 2013 proved to be a fruitful year for the team at Bioware Montreal. Things were going so well that on November 7th, or in 7 day, Bioware showed off the first looks at their next Mass Effect game. It was a short teaser, and it didn't feature any story or gameplay segments. Concept art and blurry workstations were all fans had a chance to see. Sadly for the team at Bioware Montreal, this would be the brightest days the development studio would ever see. 2014 was a major year for Bioware. In November of that year, Dragon Age Inquisition launched across the 7th and 8th generation of home consoles and PC. The roughly three-year development cycle of Inquisition was hammered with production woes, which included two delays and all three Bioware studios working on various aspects of the title. This is in addition to all of the outsourced development performed by studios located outside of North America. Inquisition's development was the first to be completed without Bioware's co-founders. During this time, Bioware's Canadian operations remained under Aaron Flynn, a longtime employee of the developer. Under Flynn, Bioware was making a major transition to develop its future games with a new engine. Previous Bioware titles had used the developer's own engines, or they chose an already existing toolkit like Unreal Engine 3. A new generation of home consoles meant that Bioware's old tech just wasn't cutting it anymore. Eventually, Bioware settled on DICE's Frostbite 3 engine due primarily to its power. The engine was also chosen due to EA already owning the rights to it. 
During the development of Dragon Age Inquisition, developers at Bioware had to spend a considerable amount of time creating their own tools and assets for Frostbite 3. Unlike the first person shooters that Frostbite 3 was built for, Bioware's RPGs required many tools that the engine was unequipped with. Most notably, Frostbite 3 struggled with animations due to so many games using a first person's perspective with little to no prolonged character interactions or cinematic cutscenes. According to the novel Blood, Sweat, and Pixels by Jason Schreier, despite the tumultuous development of Dragon Age Inquisition, the developers held their head high. Many developers rightfully anticipated that many of the issues regarding Inquisition's development would be fixed in the polishing stage of development, and that Bioware, with its vast catalog of hits, was an untouchable game developer compared to their peers. In many ways, they were right. Dragon Age Inquisition was a massive critical and commercial success when it came out in November 2014. It won Game of the Year from the Game Awards, South by Southwest Gaming Awards, and the DICE Awards, formerly known as the Interactive Achievement Awards. This was in addition to being the best-selling game in the Dragon Age series. Sadly, for the team at Bioware Montreal, things weren't looking nearly as bright. In May of 2014, Casey Hudson left Bioware, leaving the developer with a major hole in its creative management team. Later that year, Laney stepped down as well, leaving the new Mass Effect game without a director. He was replaced by Mass Effect 3 lead writer Mac Walters, making the new Mass Effect game his first as a creative director. Bioware Montreal was also running into major issues with Frostbite 3. Procedurally generated worlds were not an easy thing to make. Making them fun was even harder. Development on the title had slowed down considerably as well. Many members of Bioware Montreal were reworked into the larger Bioware teams working on Dragon Age Inquisition. Meanwhile, at Bioware Edmonton, the team that had crafted the Mass Effect trilogy were growing concerned over the long pre-production of the new Mass Effect, leading to more internal strife. Montreal was upset that they kept losing developers, and Edmonton was upset over Montreal's lack of progress. All of this happened behind closed doors. To the gaming public at large, Bioware seemed to be getting back on its feet. After two controversial releases at the start of the 2010s, Inquisition was Bioware's biggest game to date and was bringing home awards and money like past Bioware titles had. Public information on Montreal's new Mass Effect was limited during the time, but fans were given a look at more concept art on N7 Day in 2014, helping drum up the hype for Bioware's next RPG. Thankfully, fans wouldn't have to wait too much longer to get their next look at Mass Effect. During EA's press conference at E3 2015, Mass Effect Andromeda was officially revealed as the next title in the series. Fans were given a look at a whole new galaxy to explore, with the focus being drawn on the new vehicle for planetary exploration, the Nomad. The reveal was largely positive, and fans wouldn't have to wait too long. Andromeda was scheduled for release in holiday 2016 for the Xbox One, PlayStation 4, and PC. News on Andromeda remained quiet after that, with only a brief teaser featuring Jennifer Hale coming out on N7 Day in late 2015. Production of Mass Effect Andromeda went into full effect in 2015, with developers from across Bioware joining in to get the game out on time. Despite its extensive pre-production phase, Andromeda wasn't meeting its internal deadlines. Unlike other giant development teams from the likes of Ubisoft or Rockstar, Bioware's worldwide development teams struggled with proper communication. After all, until the development of Dragon Age Inquisition, the teams at Bioware were largely working on their own projects, with the Edmonton studio developing Mass Effect and Dragon Age games, while the studio in Austin focused on Star Wars The Old Republic. The end of 2015 and early 2016 saw even more departures from the Andromeda team. Among them were Chris Wynn, Senior Development Director, and Chris Schlerf, Lead Writer for Andromeda. Both men announced their departures via Twitter in December 2015 and February 2016 respectfully. In March 2016, EA and Bioware announced that they would be delaying Andromeda until quarter 1 2017. The following month, things got even worse for Bioware. Leaked gameplay of Mass Effect Andromeda made its way online, showcasing new features Bioware had yet to reveal, including the use of jetpacks in the game. However, the leaked footage looked promising, but some quickly pointed to it being a fake. This was in part due to the timing of the leak, which was first reported on on April 2nd. The gameplay leak of Andromeda might not have been what EA or Bioware wanted, but it still managed to get players excited about the next installment of the Mass Effect series. At E3 2016, Mass Effect Andromeda received a new trailer featuring new characters and a wide variety of environments. 
The protagonist of Andromeda was given a name, Ryder, and Bioware confirmed that Andromeda would not be compatible with previous Mass Effect saves. The brief trailer didn't give players too much information about Andromeda's story or gameplay, something Bioware was keeping as secretive as possible. Andromeda's final trailer of 2016 came out on N7 Day 2016, detailing the new characters and the game's story. But gameplay still wasn't being shown, and Andromeda's release date of quarter 1 2017 was coming closer and closer. By this time, Andromeda's procedurally generated worlds had been axed, with the team shifting focus to individually crafted worlds sometime in late 2015. At first, developers decided instead of endless worlds, Andromeda would feature roughly 30 instead, some of which would use the same tools used to create procedurally generated worlds in past versions of the game. However, this was cut back even further to only 7 worlds, limiting the scope Andromeda had originally set out to achieve. In a Kotaku article released by Jason Schreier in the months following Andromeda's release, anonymous developers commented that Andromeda's actual development didn't start until the end of 2015. With less than 18 months to complete the game, many of the game's features were either cut or downsized in order to meet the release. This had an especially harsh impact on the developers of Andromeda, who commented that, For the last few months of the game, we spent most of our effort just trying to keep it together, rather than polishing. Bioware's developers were still hopeful that they could pull it off. After all, Dragon Age Inquisition was completed under similar conditions. Years of floundering led to a months-long crunch, whose final product ended up being more popular than past entries in the series. Maybe Andromeda would be the same. These were the thoughts that persisted among the management team as Andromeda prepared for its final three-month push. On January 4th, 2017, Mass Effect Andromeda was given a final release date in advance of the game showing at the Consumer Electronics Show. CES was the final showcase for the game leading up to its release in March. Gameplay details were finally given out at the show, and over the next two months, new details about Andromeda would be released to the public, including the announcement of a collector's edition and other collectibles. Mass Effect Andromeda's official release date was set for March 21st in North America, but EA had other plans in mind. In an attempt to bolster their EA Access program, Mass Effect Andromeda was given a 10-hour time trial through the program. The trial launched on March 16th, five days before the release of the rest of the game. Players quickly found out, however, that Andromeda was not of the same standard as past Bioware works. While 10 hours is hardly enough time to properly critique something as massive as Andromeda, players quickly began sharing images and videos of the game's character animations. The poor qualities of these animations turned into memes and were shared across the internet, leading early impressions to be poor. Reviews for Andromeda wouldn't start coming out until a few days later, but for many, it was already too late. Mass Effect Andromeda released on March 21st, 2017, with PAL territories receiving the game two days later on the 23rd. Critical reception was mixed. Many praised the game's combat and beautiful worlds, but lambasted the various technical issues that plagued the game. Not even the game's narrative and characters could save the title, as many critics made note that the story was not of the same level as past entries. Sales suffered from the initial response. Andromeda managed to be the second best physical launch in the Mass Effect series, only being beaten by Mass Effect 3, but digital sales were substantially lower. EA has not commented on the exact numbers of Andromeda as of 2021, and there are no solid numbers on how many units the game sold. The blowback from Andromeda was immense. Similarly to how they handled Mass Effect 3's controversial ending, Bioware made a pledge in the days following release that they would address player concerns with the game's technical issues. This came in addition to new romance options for the male playable character and additional features in the character creator at the beginning of the game. In the months following Andromeda's release, rumors began floating that EA was putting the Mass Effect series on ice following the cool reception Andromeda had received. In June of 2017, a previously mentioned expose on the development of Andromeda showed the world just how chaotic things had been at Bioware over the past five years. In July, Aaron Flynn stepped down as general manager of Bioware Canada, ending his 17-year career with the developer. He was replaced by Casey Hudson, who returned to Bioware after a short stint at Microsoft. In August, EA announced that Bioware Montreal would be absorbed by EA's Motive Studio that was also located in the city. In the years since, Motive developed Star Wars Squadrons, and it was released in late 2020. Mass Effect Andromeda continued to receive patches and new DLC until August of 2017, 
that month, Bioware announced that Andromeda's single-player updates were coming to an end, although the game's multiplayer features would still receive some updates. Since Andromeda's release in 2017, the Mass Effect series as a whole has been on hiatus. Outside of the remastered Legendary Edition that launched in May 2021, no new Mass Effect games have been released or announced. A small teaser for a new Mass Effect game was released in late 2020, but no details about the game have been released to the public. Andromeda itself failed to leave much of an impact. It failed to meet expectations compared to its predecessors, and Bioware failed to receive any recognition for the release during the end of the year awards for 2017. One of the sole exceptions being Giant Bomb's Worst Game That We Played award. Bioware's follow-up to Andromeda, Anthem, was met with similar mixed reception at the time of release. In the years that have followed Anthem's release, Bioware seems to have focused its efforts on re-establishing itself as a premier game studio once again. But time will tell if the latter half of the 2010s was a fluke, or just the beginning of a dark future for the once legendary developer. Personally, I have hope that they'll be able to right the ship. The legendary edition of the Mass Effect trilogy is the perfect first step at earning the trust of fans once again, and I personally can't wait to see what Bioware has in store for us with the next entry in this fantastic series. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the video, be sure to leave a like and share the video on your favorite social media sites. In the comments below, I want to know your thoughts on Mass Effect Andromeda. Have you played it and did you enjoy it? If you would like to know more about the development of Mass Effect Andromeda, I've included a link to Jason Schreer's article detailing the game's chaotic development. The article in question and Schreer's book, Blood, Sweat, and Pixels are fantastic reads and I highly recommend them if you enjoy the same sort of content that you see on this channel. And once again, thank you for watching. Coming soon to own on video and DVD.